we could talk endlessly about the subject, I'm sure. But, you know, like I said, just for people to remember, not everybody is a narcissist, even if they have narcissistic qualities. You know, the narcissists that you want to concern yourself with or stay away from are the ones that are trying to gain something or harm you in some way. And and it's something that is very real. It is something that's really not acknowledged by a lot of people because they can't physically see, you know, if you're being physically abused, you have the black eyes, you have hand, you know, there might be some evidence, but unfortunately people don't believe victims of narcissistic abuse because some, some of us don't have that. All we have is our word, which, you know, you know, then we go out and, and when we finally have the courage to speak up, the narcissist has beat us to the crowd and already told them that you're crazy and that you don't know anything and they're not this way and they will do everything they can to be perceived in such a different light that nobody can put it together. Welcome to the Boomer Woman's Podcast. I'm your host, Agnes Knowles. Boomer Women. Are we wise women? Are we mavens? Are we crones? Hell yeah. And we're also still curious, fun-loving, interesting, the list goes on. This podcast is for you. My guests are folk who have a message for our demographic. And if you want to hear a specific message, let me know and I'll find the guests. This podcast is also a conversation. We women know its value. We know how to do it, and we must perpetuate the art form. I try and let my guests have the greater say, and usually we fit in a good laugh or two. Listen in now to today's guest. Narcissists. Too many of us know one or more. Mayo Clinic describes a narcissist thus, and trust me, this is super abridged. They have an unreasonably high sense of self-importance and require constant excessive admiration. They expect other people to do what they want without questioning them. They're unable or unwilling to recognize the needs and feelings of others. If they don't get their way or feel slighted, they can react with rage or contempt and try to belittle other people to make themselves appear superior. All this I know is true because I'm currently dealing with a narcissist in an area of my life. If you think you might have one in your life, you'll want to listen in. Let me rephrase that. You need to listen in. Today's guest considers herself the voice for victims of narcissistic abuse and shares what she knows about narcissism, its physical and mental side effects on victims, and empowers women in similar situations to put their needs first. Dana Diaz, welcome to the Boomer Woman's podcast. Thank you so much. Dana, I really, really abridged that Mayo Clinic definition. Is there anything yeah. that you think is important that you want to add? Um, you know, I actually have never heard Mayo Clinic's definition, but I think it, it's very accurate. Uh, you know, I've I've done many interviews and that's usually the first question is what is a narcissist? And I always pause for a moment because it's so difficult to summarize everything that comprises somebody that is has those narcissistic qualities especially the ones that are you know abusive and harmful and, and intentionally so t- towards other people um but i always agree with what this definition is is that they have this level of importance that supersedes everybody and everything and they just have no concern for anything other than feeling that importance and they will seek to get that out of you in whatever way they can, no matter what the cost. So I think that's what it comes down to because I've read and, and I've read books, I've read articles, I've listened to YouTubes and experts. Some people say there's five different types of narcissists, 14. I don't know how many types of narcissists there are, but every single one of them does have this really overinflated ego that they need to feed and they can do it by seeming humble and pitiful um they can do it by being very arrogant and overt um but um the malignant narcissists i think are the ones that we will probably be speaking of um today 
they are the ones that are intentionally harming other people in order to feel that sense of importance that they're they're seeking. Because there are a lot of people that have narcissistic qualities. We might even have them. But, you know, like there's somebody that I, I always is a go-to in my head. I, I know somebody who is a narcissist, but we laugh at her because she just she thinks she's all that. <laughs> and I wish I had that kind of self-esteem and it's a little overboard with her, but she's not hurting anyone with it. And she is fabulous. So, you know, <laughs> it's okay. But it's when people are, uh, again, intentionally causing harm to another human being so that they feel good about themselves. It obviously comes from a deep seated insecurity, but it's never okay to harm another human being in any form or for any reason, um, but certainly not to feel important. Now you talk about articles you've read and YouTube, all of that, but yeah. let's get down to the nitty gritty. You were married to one. What point in time did you realize that you were married to a narcissist? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be honest with you. It was a 25 year long relationship. It was probably about 20 years in and it surprised me because I was raised by a narcissist. And so, you know, I had all this baggage that I brought into the relationship that I just, I should have seen the signs. And there were so many red flags right from the beginning. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm college educated and I've, traveled the world, I'd like to think that I have a little bit more of a sense of what's going on around me, you know, than, than a lot of people are able, but I didn't see it. It's so insidious um, because the narcissist I was married to is what is typically referred to as a covert narcissist. I always likened it to the Winnie the Pooh character, Eeyore, um, you know, he always has his shoulders slumped and his head down. Poor me. I'll, I'm not happy. I'll never have this. And, you know, so it was so different from my stepfather who raised me from the time I was a year old, who is that very arrogant, demanding, just demeaning and, and condescending you know, kind of a narcissist, typically what most people would think of when they're thinking about what a narcissist is. So it was just, I've never encountered a situation where somebody that seems so humble and so pitiful. And, you know, he almost had like this victim mentality, although it never, I, I never could put that together in my head, you know, and, and that's something I discuss in my book is, you know, I'd talk to his sister and his mom and Beaver Cleaver family, beautiful family, very nice, very traditional, very proper, courteous, polite people. I didn't understand where this personality even came from and how that fit into it and why he felt um, that he needed to bully me. And, you know, there was physical aggression and there's financial abuse and sexual abuse and all these different things like where did this monster come from that came out of this very, very nice, tight-knit family? It just didn't make sense. So I would have never thought, you know, oh, he's a narcissist. I just, it was, it was in the beginning, it was, oh, he had a bad day. He's in a bad mood. You know, we all have those. I would excuse it, enable it even, you know, and then as time went on, it was, oh, he's got a real problem with anger but I seem to cause the anger. Sometimes just my existence or my presence <laughs> angered him, you know, and, and then as time went on, you know, it got to the point where he made me feel so badly about myself. I mean, everything I said was wrong. Everything I did was wrong. Nothing I could do or say would, would calm things or make him, you know, happy, you know, but in the midst of all this, he was tearing me down, bullying me, calling me names, like I said, taking advantage of me, of my body, all kinds of things. So I'm on the computer Googling how to be a good wife. And how sad is that? But I'm, I, I get all these things pop up, you know, on one end, it's, you know, being a Christian wife, you know, you, 
you should, you know, be patient and, and all these things. And I'm a faithful person. So I thought, yeah, I have to stay and I have to put up with it. He is my husband. I did know who he was before I married him. So I kind of had this, you made your bed lie in it mentality and went along with it. But then all these other things would come up about narcissists and I thought, hmm, I wonder what that's about. And then I had a friend tell me what gaslighting was. And I thought, oh, okay. And then it all kind of started to make more sense to me because it's it's so fascinating to me that narcissists, I talked to people in Australia, the UK, US, I, I had a podcast in India last week. It just everybody I talk to narcissists, it's like they, they all operate under the same mindset, but even using the same verbiage when abusing their victims, it's, it's uncanny. It's like they've been downloaded with software. Um, and there are even people and, and no offense, I don't buy into this. I've heard that they're aliens. I don't know about that. But, <laughs> you know, they do have this, the this MO they rely on uh, to basically give you enough of what you need so that you stay but all the all at the same time they are also taking advantage of you and abusing you it's really a disgusting cycle but that's why people stay because unfortunately many of us have the comments from other people well if it's so bad why didn't you leave or why don't you leave it's not just easy to leave even if you're not being abused and you're not happy you know, when you have a child and you have a house and the families and all, it, it, it's not as easy as just walking away. Yeah, absolutely. Now, at, at the risk of staying too long in a, in a psychology textbook, it sounds like, you know, you, you have the superiority complex. In your case, it was almost like an inferiority complex, but yeah. they always meet at the same place of verbal, mental, physical yes. abuse. Yes, absolutely. Um, but even the duplicity of that, the it, it was definitely an inferior, I can't say the word, inferiority <laughs> complex. But at the same time, he felt like he was entitled to more than the average person. So there was a level of superiority in there. And, and again, that's why I think it caught me off guard because my narcissistic stepfather was just the, he was the king of everything and knew everything and his way or no way. I was more used to that type of narcissist. So this caught me off guard and, but it does, they, they, they are very careful. They know you inside and out. They know what you're thinking. They know what you need. They know what you need them to say. They know how to manipulate you. And that's the key. They manipulate you. They manipulate situations to get what they want, to make them feel that superiority. It's just in the case of a covert narcissist, like who I was married to, um, they do it in a way you almost feel sorry for them. And I'm a people pleaser because I came out of a house where I had the very arrogant narcissist uh, upbringing and, and my mother you know, unfortunately enabled it, excused it, even tried to get me to submit to it. And I was just a little too strong willed for either of them to, you know, break me. So yeah, it's just really, it, it's really awful um, to think that somebody, you know, it's kind of like the wolf in sheep's clothing. You just don't see it until it, it, it bites you and, and, and it can kill you too. As I discuss in my book, the physical consequences as well. So, so did you know that your stepfather was a narcissist or did all those pieces start to come together after years of marriage and try, you finding that? I, word? yeah, I knew what he was. I didn't have the label for it. Okay. If that makes any sense. Yeah. I mean, little girls don't normally walk around talking about narcissism, but I'm not sure exactly at what point that became a common turn. I, I, I know it's thrown around very loosely right now. But I mean, my stepfather, the thing about that was that, you know, they say children can sense things that, you know, maybe we as adults have, you know, all these societal, you know, ideas in our head or perspectives that we've been taught that children don't have yet. I knew from day one, I just never, I never liked him. Um, just something about him seemed fake or off. 
and I noticed, and I mean, I'm talking very little, four, five, six years old. He was one way if we were around family, if we were around, you know, in public, oh, his arm was around me. And oh, yeah, I was, you know, like, just like his little girl, even though I wasn't his, but behind closed doors, oh, it was a different story. It was constantly telling me, and I mean, I am a little girl. He was telling me nobody would ever love me. Nobody ever wanted me, including my mother, which unfortunately was true. But to say that out loud over and over, he would tell me I was a burden. He shouldn't have to pay for another man's child, all these things. And then I was fed these stories of nobody needs to know you're not his. Don't tell anybody you need to start calling him dad. Don't call him by his first name because we don't want people to know. You know, it was putting on a show. I always say I called it the happy family facade. We were to leave the house. Once we walked out that door, we were smiling and we were going to pretend we were biologically, you know, perf- related, perfectly normal family, you know, going out to the block party or the family celebration or whatever. And nobody knew. And then I found myself doing the same thing with my ex you know, went to the son's t-ball games with cupcakes and smiles. And we just put on the show and nobody had any idea what was going on. But I couldn't say anything. When I was little, I found out the hard way that if I spoke, you know, my truth, it didn't get me uh, anything good. I I mean, there were definitely consequences to be paid. And I was physically abused. Um, Those were usually the consequences. Um, In my marriage, there was physical aggression, but he never actually (laughs) made contact with me, so to speak, but it was raising a crowbar over my head and swinging it down. It was shooting a gun outside my bedroom. It was banging on the door with a knife, um, taking doors off hinges so I couldn't get out of a room, you know, and, and this is it, people need to understand too, at least in my experience, this wasn't just once in a while. This was every single day. And that really messes with your mentality and, and your emotional stability and, and your sense of self. And, and, you know, I basically lived in fear <laughs> most of my life. And, and that is what eventually caused my body um, to have the reaction it did. Um, when you're living in fight or flight, that's when you either, you know, get all this adrenaline to fight your situation. Let's say like if somebody broke into your house and you're going to fight them or you flee. I'm more of a fleeing kind of a person. I just figure get out of the situation. But either way, your body pumps these stress hormones into your body. For me, it was cortisol, which is very similar to adrenaline. When you're stressed, cortisol pumps into your body. But so much was pumping into my body over so long of a period of time that my body thought it was some foreign, um, you know, virus or something that shouldn't be there. It attempted to eradicate it. And in doing that, my white blood cell count was almost depleted. Red blood cell count fell long and short of it. My entire body and neurological issues, car, uh, cardiology issues, um, muscular issues. I I mean, you name it. I went autoimmune because of it. So I live with a lot of autoimmune flares. I could be okay one second and have to basically go lay down. It's very similar to fibromyalgia, what I experienced sometimes. I also ended up with a lung disease that's very rare, but it's very common in victims of abuse um, because I would hold my breath when I was scared or I, I talk about in my book how often I was like a rabbit. If if I sensed danger, I would just stiffen and paralyze myself almost, but I would stop breathing because I couldn't risk being discovered because I was so afraid of what would happen. So I ended up with this lung disease now that the neurologist said is similar to COPD. You can hear the raspiness in my voice. That's That's the result. I've never smoked a cigarette in my life or anything for that matter, but it's very sad that it can actually cause this much harm to your body, you know, and and it's not easy when people say, let it go, put it in the past. I can't, I live with the consequences of both of these narcissists every day of my life. 
And, you know, at one point, um, before I was out of my situation with my ex-husband, I, I was so sick. I was down to 93 pounds skeletal. I could barely breathe. I could barely move because my muscles were not getting enough oxygen. My heart was barely pumping. They talked about putting a stent in me and I was in my early forties. You know, the doctor said, your body is shutting down. And that's a scary thing to hear. That's a scary thing. You hear that in hospice. You hear that when you're 90 or a hundred years old, maybe not when you're 41, 42 years old. And that's when I, that was kind of like the straw that broke the camel's back where I just said, okay, that I thought I was doing the noble thing. I have traditional ideas and, and values. And I thought, no, I, I need to stay. I need to figure this out. I don't need to be happy. I just need to be here. So my son has his family unit intact. But when it came down to, do I want to live or do I want to continue to live in this situation? I finally chose myself and, and I'm glad I did because I'm, I'm not, I'll never be cured, but I have put weight back on. My nervous system is finally settled to where I can sleep more than two or three hours at night. I, you know, I, I have so many other things, you know, that I've suffered as a result, but everything is settling, you know, so I don't feel so sick so much anymore. You know, I've got energy back and I look like, you know, a normal human being should, you know, my face is filling out. Everything's just feeling more normal, but this is a result of narcissistic abuse. And, and so people need to understand that whether it's bullying or emotional or verbal, they may not put their hands on you, but they can still kill you. <laughs> just as an aside here, um, yeah. in terms of how you look now, when you first came on screen, it was like, oh, my God, she's really pretty. <laughs> so, oh, thank you. <laughs> if, if I can go back briefly, when you got married, did it take time for his true colors to show or was it like I've got her now and boom, it's this is the way it is? It was well before we got married. Oh. When we met... <laughs> when we first met, honestly, I thought he was, a, a he was very aloof and, you know, just disinterested. I thought he was a jerk. You know, there, there was in our interaction, he even seemed like, I, I remember thinking, oh, he's one of these that wants, you know, servitude. He feels entitled, like I'm supposed to just, you know, do what he wants me to do. And I, I after coming out of the situation, you know, with my stepfather, oh, I'm not, no, uh, -uh I'm not doing that for anybody. So it was interesting that then after I initially met him, we were in a situation where he actually approached me, you know, not for a date, but just to hang out, watch a movie in his apartment. And I don't know what I was thinking. I just remember I felt very lonely, you know, for, for a multitude of reasons. I, was just newly on my own in my own apartment. And I just, unfortunately, you know, I guess, I don't know if I want to lump my entire generation, but the mentality that I had that I think a lot of women can relate to is I was so afraid at that point, like I wasn't even dating anybody. I thought, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to be, you know, like the old maid. I want, I, at some point I thought I would be married, you know, in a few short years. So I, I was kind of a, of this mindset of, well, you know, I didn't like him at first, not a good first impression, not somebody I would pursue or, or have any interest in, but you never know. I, I tried to, I like to think I'm open-minded and I met a different version of him. Um, somebody who was funny and charming and everything he's, you know, we shared about our lives and, and he related and I thought, wow, he's the black sheep of his family too. And, you know, he started using these words, it's the two of us against the world. And, you know, it, he threw the, I love you out very quickly in about what, six weeks, he had me moved in with him. He had me convinced, but, but also in that short amount of time, the anger, the lashing out at me for things that were so minimal. And, you know, it was alarming to me. 
But again, that's where I was like, oh, but I know he is this charming, wonderful person. I saw him with his parents. I saw him with his grandparents. He he was amazing. He was so loving and so, you know, giving and charitable with his time. And so I thought, oh, you know, just a bad day, bad mood. But the signs were there. He was very angry. There was a lot of, like I said, physical aggression, but no contact. I just thought maybe he just has issues with anger. Um, but it, it, it I, unfortunately, I learned the hard way that that was not the case. Um, so yeah, the signs were always there. As far as getting married, again, it goes back to it. That was just my own personal mistake. I did not have enough self-esteem and self-worth. And I think that's primarily because of the way I was raised to think that I wasn't worthy and that I wasn't deserving. And I did worry after being told, you know, for the whole 18 years, I was under my mother and stepfather's roof that to be told I was not lovable and nobody would ever love me. I just wanted so bad. Even if I didn't feel it, I thought, well, he wants to marry. He asked me to marry him. He wants me here. But when they started playing the wedding march, the day of the wedding, I panicked. And I, the first thought in my head when I heard that music was, I don't want to do this. I always knew we were going to get divorced. I never, ever thought it was a good idea for us to be together. But I want, I mean, don't we all want love? We all want somebody to love us and we want to have, you know, this union and, and have, well, not everyone wants children, but we all want, you know, some whatever our ideal is. And and that's what I thought in my head was, you know, I'll grow to love him. There's things I do love about him. It'll be okay. I'll try. And I tried for 25 years, but it just wasn't going to work. Now, you said that he approached you. (laughs) This sort of sounds weird, but can narcissists almost like smell the personality they're looking for? Yes. That will, will submit to them, put it that way. I believe that they do. They're very, very perceptive. Again, it's kind of like how they know exactly what to say to you. They, they learn you very quickly. You don't even know they're watching. You don't know they're observing. They learn very, very fast who you are and what type, you know, we, we give a lot of that vibe off, um, even non-verbally and they pay attention I mean, my gosh, you spend just, you know, a couple minutes with a narcissist and they'll know your favorite foods, favorite color, where you want to go, what you want to do, the best Christmas present to get to you. You know, they, 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 they just are like sponges absorbing this information. And certainly we all do that when we're entering into, you know, a friendship or romantic relationship or any kind of family relationship with somebody that we are, you know. I don't know what the right word is here, but that we are interested in having a close relationship with, but they do it at hypersonic speed (laughs) because they have to, because they cannot manipulate you unless they know you that well. But yes, I've heard people say that, and I've even been referred to as a narcissist magnet. It definitely feels that way sometimes, but certainly even the verbiage that is used in the narcissistic community is that these narcissists prey upon what they call a target. They do hunt you down. So there is something that they see in you that they feel they're going to get, you know, they, they call this supply. What they're looking for is their supply and you are their target or to supply themselves with whatever it is that you have of value to them. You know, whether it is that servitude and submission um, sometimes, and and sometimes I thought this was the case with my ex too, um, because he saw my stepfather was so, he was so showy with his things and, and what he had that I thought maybe my ex thought that I, that was his ticket to having some of that or inheriting it at some point, or, you know, I don't know, but. Um, definitely I was a resource or a source of something for him. Definitely finances and status symbols like cars and houses, watches, you know, audio, you know, things that have value are also a very, very big uh, factor in that. Narcissists really like 
all narcissists like to have things that make them appear that they have a higher status than what they really do. So part of that is then that, that perfect marriage sham. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, the, the thing is, and I appreciate the compliment, you know, on my appearance, it's very nice of you, but the one thing, the one thing he was always very positive about in our relationship. He always told me for, I think every single day in those 25 years, multiple times a day would tell me how beautiful I was. And it, it, it was nice, but then it started not being nice because I started to feel like that's what I was, you know, that, that trophy wife kind of mentality. And I am by no means, I don't think I'm that kind of a a person um, that feels that I'm qualified to be a, a trophy wife. But I think for him, I was, and I was, I, I had a higher education than him. And he came from a small town. I came from the city and, you know, I was in symphonic orchestras, you know, playing viola and I played piano and I, I just, you know, I think that, I, I don't know. I thought maybe he thought he'd have this, you know, very lavish life with this beautiful wife he thought he had. And even after the divorce, even after the divorce, I would get these messages for, or emails from him guilting me while well, I did have a beautiful wife. I did have a beautiful, and it's just like, I, I don't know, go get another one. I, I don't know what to tell you, you know? I, I mean, it, like I said, it seems like a nice thing. Of course, you want the person you're with to to find you attractive, but um, it was with him, at least it, it was, it was a quality that made him look good. And my education made him look good. My career made him look good. You know, the house we could afford with my salary made him look good. So I yeah, think I, I was can... just a utility to him. Well, yeah, I was just going to say that he's basically saying to society, look what I can attract. Exactly. But it wasn't attraction. It was more. Oh, yeah. Fear. (laughs) (laughs) It was it was fear that kept me. And that's that's sad. Yeah. So if someone's listening right now who um, isn't in a relationship, uh, maybe they've met somebody. Are there any telltale signs like right from the get go that just might be a flag to to back off a wee bit or to take your time uh, in a relationship? Absolutely. Um, You know, my biggest advice in a situation like that is not so much dictating what signs to look for in the other person, but to listen to yourself. Number one, if you're, if you have a gut feeling, even if you have no reason for it, if you do not feel something is right or something's not adding up, listen to it. Don't ignore it. You know, my great grandma used to say your gut feelings are really your guardian angel whispering in your ear. It was a nice thing to tell a little girl, whatever it is you think, trust me when I'm telling you that your body, your senses, you know what's right and wrong for you personally. And if something feels off, it probably is. In the beginning, unfortunately, everybody puts their best foot forward. And narcissists are especially good at this because they cannot risk you getting away from them and, and going with somebody else. Um, but definitely, the so listen to yourself. Big red flag is if you ever feel afraid. Because I did feel afraid about three weeks into this, you know, relationship that lasted 25 years. And it that was a big red flag for me. If you are ever afraid in any relationship, it's not okay. And I don't care if you met the person yesterday and you feel afraid, do not make excuses. Do not I I I I give my son advice for many things in life as a mother, we all do. And one of the things I always tell him is is it's either yes or no, true or false. You, you don't go with maybes, you don't excuse things, you don't need to think about a lot of things. Usually the answer is right in front of you, you just don't want to see it. But with people, with relationships, absolutely, if you 
are fearful of somebody if they exhibit some very unreasonable anger, let's say, or if they get physically aggressive or reactive to things, um, that is a big problem. Um, but definitely, you know, as far as telltale signs, you know, the status thing is a big one. If they're driving a very expensive vehicle and they're wearing a Rolex and they've got name brand clothes on and every hair is exactly in place and they work out at the gym two hours a day. And again, I don't mean offense. There are people that are very fortunate to be blessed with the ability to afford all those things and live wonderful lives. And they are not narcissists and they're wonderful, lovely people. But <laughs> A lot of times a narcissist will fall into that. They want to give off that impression of look at what I have. Every narcissist loves status symbols. So that's a big thing too. You know, it's one thing to impress somebody, but to constantly have to impress everybody um, is a different story. And also I would say if somebody seems a little distant with you, but then they come back, you know, almost, it's almost like a yin and a yang, or I call it like the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where you're not sure if they're still interested or they don't call you, or maybe you're sitting at a restaurant and they're checking out the waitress or looking around. They don't have much to say. That's somebody that's not really engaging with you, but then they come back, you know, two days later and they have a dozen red roses and they want to take you for a night on the town or give you this lavish gift. And it's all about you. And they're caressing your cheek and being affectionate. There's this constant push and pull with narcissists. And again, it's because they know they're not really interested in you. They just are interested in what they get from you. So if you feel that them pull back, but that they come right at you. They they sense they're losing you. You know, they'll pull you back in. That constant ebb and flow, probably not a good sign. If this is getting too personal, you can tell me. But I should think that while you left that person for your own life's sake, surely it was the best thing for your son as well. Yes, in many ways. And and I will, <laughs> I will say this, I was planning to leave, I had discussed it with an attorney. And unfortunately, a few days after I spoke to an attorney about divorce, we went into the shelter in place for COVID. So I was stuck in the house with him and the courts were closed. And I know it was the universe's joke on me. But during that time, he actually is the one who ended up moving out of the house I with no notice. I came home from work one afternoon and just was going about my business and started noticing like, oh, there used to be something on the wall over there. And then I started noticing more things. And then I got to the bedroom, looked in there, the sheets, the pillow, everything was gone. So he had actually left me because he's a narcissist and a narcissist can't be rejected. They have to reject the person they're with. So he did me a favor. <laughs> but as far as my son, it's it's really hard. Yes, you would think it's the best thing for him. But my son, you have to remember, this was not even the first time that my ex had left me. He had left in the past. So it's been really hard on my son. My son just turned 20 years old, but he's always going to be a kid who wants his dad's approval. And he's always going to look for it. So he took a lot of, you know, anger out on me. In the beginning, he was understanding, but he was also so unfazed because unfortunately, as much as I tried to protect him from hearing or seeing a lot of things, and he does not know everything, he did unfortunately witness a lot. So, you know, even that day that his dad moved out and he came home and he looked around and I, I noticed he was noticing everything I, I saw. And I, I, I sat him down and talked to him. I said, well, you know, you know, your dad and I don't get along and, and it looks like your dad's made the decision, you know, to move on. And I think we're going to probably, you know, not be married anymore. And my son just looked at me very matter-of-factly. I mean, as if we were just talking about what to have for dinner. 
He goes, oh, you know, he'll change his mind in five minutes. Just go get him. Just go get him and bring him back. And I just, I looked at my son and I said, you know, th- this, I, I have done that in the past, but I said, honey, this time I, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And and he was angry. He was angry with me. And, and unfortunately, narcissists will lie and, and, and tell people things about you so that you seem like the monster. And, and I unfortunately had to endure that. Um, and to this day, he tells my son, things. And I am not going to be that mother that puts my son in the position of having to choose which parent to believe, because that is something my son has brought to my attention that he has been told one thing by his dad. And he says, you either don't tell me things or you defend yourself and say it's the exact opposite. He said, I'm not going to have to choose. And I said, and nor do you have to, and I'm not going to bother you with any of it because it's not your business. This is between you know, your dad and I, and it doesn't include you. So I just want my son to be, you know, unfortunately, I think having a happy, healthy, normal life is uh, not what we uh, gained by being in that situation. But being out of it and being an adult, I will say that he's very aware um, of things. I wish things were different for him. I wish he had, I mean, at the risk of using, a, you know, who has a normal childhood, but I wish that it had been better for him and for us, but he's okay. I, my biggest worry though, and, and I can say that anybody who has been in a narcissistic marriage or relationship where there were children, um, our biggest fear is that our children will turn out the same way. And I'm not going to lie. I I am very, very concerned um, because that's his male role model. And I have seen signs of it. And that's not the young man that I raised. But I at this point, you know, it, it's time will tell. But it's sad. I, I pray to God that that's not the case. But I have a feeling that that he will fall into a lot of narcissistic uh, behaviors and and follow the same path his dad did, but, but I will be there. That's my son. And, and I love him and I'm not going to abandon him. I, I, I think I didn't think he was quite that old. So my thought was that, you know, his, what he thinks a marriage looks like is this is not healthy, you know, so to, to get him out of that. But if he's already a young adult, then yeah. Yeah, he is, but he hasn't had any real serious relationships nor any interest in them, which, you know, also makes me wonder, you know, how it it obviously affected him. So, but even when he was little, I'll be honest with you, I had a potential way out when he was two years old. And that's probably my biggest regret is that I didn't just take it. Um, Because I I did study psychology in college, I studied journalism and psychology. Um, And one of the things that they talk about in child psychology is that children are wired by the time they're about six or seven years old, Um, with so much information, but certainly by then they've developed an idea of what relationships should, should be and and what's involved and what roles are and expectations and including familial and societal. And, and so, you know, it's, it's awful to think that at such a young age, we've already, you know, we've already decided what our life is going to look like or what we expect it to look like. But um, if, if that's true, and I I've read that in from so many sources, then, then boy, a lot of us are in trouble, (laughs) you know, but, but I hope that we all do the best we can. I mean, as parents and grandparents and family friends, you know, I'd like to think that we are still good, decent people that if we can be self-aware and, kind of be on the lookout for our children and the children of people we love and the children in the family that we can at least help them to be better people as well. And that's what I'll do with my son. But there are times if I may be completely, which I am completely direct and honest, there are times that being around my son, I I feel my, even my body reacts. It's like being around my ex and and I've had to literally just walk away and just it it's too much for me i can't take it but when on when he's not acting like his dad he's he's my son he's my baby boy and i love him 
But, you know, it's like I always I, I get a lot of people that have told me over the years, you know, a lot of people don't believe victims of narcissistic abuse or any abuse. And it's really upsetting because I'll have people say, well, he doesn't look like he'd act that way. I've never seen him act that way, you know, things like this. And I'm like, well, you know, serial murderers don't walk around in the streets like Chucky the doll with the knife and the crazy hair. And, you know, <laughs> it, again, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing. So it's just something you just have to be aware of, you know, that when, again, going back to the red flags, just really people just have to listen to their own gut to know what's right and wrong. Um, you know, I can't say for everybody, there's some, you know, certain thing, but, um, definitely if you have children with somebody that's like this, just be aware that your children are listening. They are seeing, they are going to develop ideas about it all. And, and, and you will, you know, likely end up like me worrying about it. But, you know, again, I always tell people, yeah, well, when you see serial murderers or criminals on tr trial, their mothers are always sitting, you know, in the stands behind them. When you're a mother, that's that's your child. Just like my ex's mother, you know, I she expressed to me a few times throughout the 25 years, you know, some sympathy for me. And I, I, I am positive she knows who her son is, but that's her son. And that's how I feel about mine. You know, you got to love them still. Um, and, and thank you for being so candid about, yeah. about it all. You had a talking point on, on your uh, profile about whether narcissists are different from other toxic relationships. And I mean, we, we've heard the classic ones. I wasn't even fully aware of what narcissism was until I had one come into my life. But okay. um, are, is it different than other toxic relationships? Yeah, I think it can be. I think narcissism is just, a, I would say it's a subtype of a toxic relationship. Um, toxic relationships, I would simply say, are any relationships. And again, it could be a coworker, a family member, a romantic um, partner, a friend. It could be anybody. But a toxic relationship is one in which somebody is suffering at the hands of the other in some way, it, you know, kind of like if you think, you know, um, of toxic substances, if you inhale mold, your lungs are going to be affected. If you, you know, in, in real estate, they have lead-based paint and mine subsidence and all these things, those are toxins. Um, it's the same thing in relationships. If something, you know, about a relationship with somebody is affecting you negatively, it's a toxic relationship. So narcissism, I would say, is a subtype of that, if that makes any sense, because narcissists are definitely unique in their own way and, and they're separate. You know, there there are, you know, we all see stories on the news, let's say, of like domestic violence and stuff. That doesn't mean that the person abusing their partner is a narcissist. So narcissists are just a different type. Wow. Now, I did mention that I am in, uh, I have this person, put it that way. Yes. Fortunately for me, it's an, an arm's length relationship that will end in okay. the near future. But one thing that drives me crazy when I'm dealing with this person is the fact that I get so angry with myself for allowing them to affect me so viscerally. And it really is visceral. Um, yeah. is, is that normal? Like, it is completely normal. It's completely normal because you are a human being with a heart and a mind and and you obviously are a good considerate person um, who's being affected. And the problem is with narcissists is they don't care. And I think that's what we struggle with is we're mad at ourselves for allowing it. But at the same time, I think where the anger comes from or that frustration is that we don't, we don't understand why they are so inconsiderate and why they lack empathy. I mean, I hate to call them monsters, but it's disturbing to think somebody could be so callous and so cruel um, and so intentionally so towards another, especially us, because we're thinking that we've been kind, you know, we've, we've, we're not deserving of the treatment. 
it's not warranted. It might be an overreaction or it's unreasonable in some way. So I think that's where a lot of our frustration comes from. But we're also, you know, narcissists don't go for very, um, what's the word here? They don't want a challenge. They kind of sense that we might not confront them as directly as somebody else might. I know in my situation, like I said, I was looking for approval. I was more of a people pleaser or, you know, I, I, I've, unfortunately I've watched my husband. He's, he doesn't like conflicts. So he's kind of an appeaser to avoid, you know, confrontation. So when you have qualities like that, where you don't want to have upset or conflict like that, I think they know that. And that's a little bit a part of why they target you. Um, because they know you're not going to give them much of a challenge. They don't want to put that much work into it or have that much of a fight. Which but is you're perfectly normal. Yeah, it is all very interesting, but you're perfectly normal. I mean, we are allowed to feel. They don't like to let us think we're allowed to feel anything because if we react to something or we feel something, it's not okay. They're the only ones that are entitled to feelings and, and reactions and behaviors. So no, you're perfectly normal. It's, it's, it's such a, <laughs> I don't want to use bad words, but you know, it really messes with your thinking to try to wrap your head around a lot of the things that go on in with a narcissist. But I think that's part of what they're trying to do too. They, they, they usually call you crazy at some point or some form of crazy, but they actually want you to, they actually try to confuse you, make you doubt your sense of reality. Uh, they question your perceptions, uh, you know, with the gaslighting and the manipulation, um, they don't want you to understand anything. They don't want you to be on to them. So I think that's why people like you and I, we go back to ourselves and say, well, is it me? Is there something I could have said differently or done differently? But there's not, you know, but we internalize it because we want things to be different and we know they can be, but um, narcissists aren't going to allow that. Usually they want what they want and that's what it is. You said something very interesting there because I am the person who has challenged this person. Mm. So, and I'm sticking to my guns because I'm right. And it, it's about a lot of money. <laughs> um, oh, so, a narcissist and money involved. That's a uh, surprise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. yeah, that, that explains a lot then. So you are the, pre yeah, you're, yeah, that's a tough one. That's good though. I mean, and you should stick to your guns. That's the thing. Don't back down. You know, it took me a long time to find my voice with my ex. And that's why the end, I think he bowed out because he knew I, I was, that was it. They don't want to work that hard. <laughs> yeah, they really don't. Okay. Is there anything I haven't asked you about narcissists that you think is important? We've covered a fair bit and I really appreciate how open you've been. Oh, absolutely. Um, no, I think we've covered quite a bit. I mean, we could talk endlessly about the subject, I'm sure. Um, but you know, like I said, just for people to remember, not everybody is a narcissist, even if they have narcissistic qualities you know, the narcissists that you want to concern yourself with or stay away from are the ones that are trying to gain something or harm you in some way. And, and it's something that is very real. It is something that's really not acknowledged by a lot of people because they can't physically see, you know, if you're being physically abused, you have the black eyes, you have hand, you know, there might be some evidence, but unfortunately people don't believe victims of narcissistic abuse because some some of us don't have that all we have is our word which you know you know then we go out and and when we finally have the courage to speak up the narcissist has beat us to the crowd and already told them that you're crazy and that you don't know anything and they're not this way and they will do everything they can to um be perceived in such a different light that nobody can put it together so just be careful. I just tell people, be careful. And if you are in a narcissistic relationship, whether it's with a family member or a romantic partner, or whoever, where you are actually living in the same home with them, just, you know, of course we want you out, but I never will 
tell anybody to force themselves out of the situation. Make sure you are comfortable leaving and make sure most importantly, you are safe because for me at least, and, and I've noticed for a lot of people, when you leave, that's when things get really bad. It's not pretty, and I'm not going to lie about that. A lot of times when you leave, or you know, it was after my divorce that things the, the violence escalated, and I was actually in fear of my life. So just for everybody to be very safe and you know, certainly reach out. There are many resources for people that are aware of and will support you through, you know, narcissistic abuse recovery. Um, so just seek those people out, you know, whether it's through your podcast, um, you know, just even listening, sometimes it makes people feel better and know there's a way out. And, you know, they can certainly go to my website or, or you know, Facebook, there's multiple groups. But unfortunately, our criminal justice systems, not just in the US, but all over the world, are not really acknowledging narcissistic abuse. So it's very difficult to have criminal consequences for these people. So we have to be safe. I always begin and end um, my conversations with uh, a script. And okay. you've just touched on an interesting piece that I will do when we, when we do conclude. <laughs> you've written a book, though. Okay. Tell us about that. Yes, I wrote my book, Gasping for Air, The Stranglehold of Narcissistic Abuse. It is about my 25-year-long relationship with my ex. It, I never set out necessarily to write a book. It was actually, the book is a, a compilation of stories that came out of a notebook um, because I was constantly being told this didn't happen. I never said that, I, you know, after 20 some years, you start to wonder, am I perceiving things that you know, is my perspective that skewed? So I kept a notebook and I kept it in my un, under the cushion of my basement sofa where he couldn't find it, at least I hoped, but I would record the date and time, what was said, what happened. And it just came to me one day after I got out of the relationship that, you know, I thought I was so unique and and, and that nobody experienced the things I experienced. And when I discovered there is actually, you know, something to this narcissism exists. And many, many women, generations of women um, have been going through this, but nobody talks about it. Polite society doesn't want you to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. You're supposed to be positive and pretend it didn't happen. People in general don't like to share with others because the narcissist puts on this show and nobody believes you you know, and, and a lot of people are just scared. And honestly, even when I wrote my book, the day it was published, I should have been very happy. It was a very big accomplishment, but I was terrified. I was sweating, almost having a panic attack because I thought, oh my gosh, if he finds out, but it's very important to speak up about it. So I wrote the book. I told about my experience um, and there will be a second book coming out hopefully by the end of the year. We're in the process um, and that will discuss my upbringing by a narcissistic parent and, and, and then my mother who just turned her head to it. I am in the process of writing my third book, which discusses <laughs> my, I, I am also in a situation currently with a friend of a uh, over 15 years that I never saw, I, you know, you'd think I'd know, you think I would know by now <laughs> what to look for. But um, boy, I found out the real hard way when a friend turns on you and turns out to be, you know, a very, very, very harmful narcissist. So there will be more to come, but I think everybody can relate on some level. And I've also been told it's a page turner. So even if you're sitting on a beach and just need a good read, I guess uh, I'm glad I can provide that. <laughs> <laughs> just as an aside, parts of this book, you worked on parts of the book with Axel Author Services, did you? I did. I had them do my manuscript evaluation and my copy editing and everything. I just yeah. inter I interviewed Alexa last June. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, so she great. and I communicate. Well, yeah, we've had a long standing three year relationship now. <laughs> She's amazing. She's Where amazing. do we find your book? We find it on Amazon, or you can go to my website, uh, Dana S Diaz.com. And there will be a link right on the homepage there where you can buy it. Okay. And I was going to ask where we find you on the World Wide web, but it's Perfect. Dana S Diaz. And yes. that'll be in the show notes. Uh, you're on social. Yes, I am on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I think that's it. But yeah, 
You can find me on any of those uh, platforms. And certainly I always encourage people, even if you you don't have to buy the book, but if you, you want to discuss the book, because a lot of people read the book and then they message me and say, I have so many questions. I, I am an open book, um, as I hope everybody knows by now. So feel free to message me on any of those social media platforms or even just about narcissistic abuse in general. And I do have a quiz on my website where you can kind of determine if you're in a, an abusive narcissistic relationship. Um, you know, if anyone wants more information about like those red flags we were talking about. In my notes, I, I have, before we wrap, could I ask you a personal question? And I'm <laughs> thinking, oh my God, this whole conversation has been so personal. Yeah. Um, but, but may I ask you one more? Yeah, of course. What's Doug like? Doug is amazing. Doug is amazing. He and I knew each other. It, so I'll, I'll, I'm very honest and upfront. So this friend that has turned out to be a narcissist that I'm currently dealing with. That is Doug's sister-in-law. And um, so I've known Doug for many, many years. And it was just, he, he has a very protective nature over people he cares about. And when he saw everything that was happening over time, he kind of stepped in. And then after my divorce, it just kind of one day we looked at each other like, oh, <laughs> you were there all along. I just didn't recognize you because I was in this other fog, you know? So, so yeah, things are, it, it's just, it's a wonderful thing. And this is why I say, if there's anything off in, or in any relationship, listen to it because with him, we, we had been friends. We'd known each other. I'd known his family for years, but when it came to like, oh, we kind of like each other it just, it just fell into place like it was always supposed to be. I hate to sound like this idealistic, like, oh, it was meant to be, he's the one, but he is so gentle and so patient. And even though he doesn't understand a lot, he is always supportive. And that is the most important thing. Cause I, I really need somebody that he, he's so my opposite as far as personality and everything, you know, but he, he brings me down a couple notches, just a couple though. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you that question so that our listeners would know there is real love and delight and sanity after narcissistic abuse. So thank you. Yes. I, and, and I will say that there really is just, I don't like to hear that people close themselves off to love after something like that, because there is true love out there. Good. Okay, so website link will be in the show notes. Perfect. All the other links will be on your page at our website. Okay. Listeners, if you have thoughts on today's show, please talk to us. Leave comments where you're listening, or if you're listening at the Boomer Woman's Podcast at boomwithabang.com, scroll to the bottom of the page and talk to us there. Leave stars and reviews where you can. They help us grow. Share this episode. Dana's explained how so many victims suffer in silence where nobody believes them how often it is other people who maybe know first thinking of his mother mm -hmm. um so whether you're the one in the relationship or it's a loved one and this is where you touched on what is in my notes if someone recognizes themselves in dana's words in dana's experiences sharing this episode with someone could well be their first step to getting help couldn't it Yes, absolutely. Good. Dana Diaz, thank you for being my guest today and sharing your story and your strength with us. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the week.